Next up, we have the president's talk. Uh, Dr. Mark Stovak will be giving a talk next. This is one of our uh, leadership talks. Um, like I said, I think it's important for all of us as we enter medicine um, and medical careers to recognize the, the leadership roles that you guys will be taking, uh, whether it's uh, within the or AMSSM organization or within your local medical institution, um, uh, the, lo the local community that you find yourself in. And so I think there's a lot we can learn from those who have gone before us. Um, and uh, so I look forward to hearing what Dr. Stovak has to say. Dr. Stovak is the uh, is faculty at the University of Nevada, Nevada Reno. Uh, he is the current uh, president of AMSSM. Uh, he has been past chair of a bunch of committees uh, involved with uh, NCAA, uh, safeguards and medical aspects of sports, um, has been involved with NCAA and a bunch of things relating to concussion has been sports medicine director for inst local institutions and uh, fellowship director as well. So Dr. Stovak. Well, thanks. Um, it's hard to compete with biostats. So uh, I'll try to do my best. Um, uh, but I know Stephanie does a great, a great talk. So Kyle asked me to talk about um, leadership. How do I advance this thing? Uh, okay. And this is, this is kind of how, how I feel like uh, leadership experience. Well, I, I have 13 people follow me on Twitter. You know, I, I don't know that physicians like all go to leadership academies and, you know, come out with our leadership degrees. It just is kind of something that happens along the way, I think. Um, and so uh, th this basically just says that she, she didn't think that of herself as a leader uh, until slowly she became one. And I'm not, I'm not a female, but I, I kind of feel like that is how it, it applied to me is it just kind of happened along the way. Um, it, it wasn't like my goal to be the president of AMSSM. It's just doors, doors opened along the way and I kept going through them. Um, it says a, a good leader has to be willing to be disliked. You must be a great leader. Uh, what do you mean by that? Sorry, I didn't expect you to be listening to me. Um, so I think this has two really good points, right? Um, I like Dilbert, but um, one is obviously you have to listen, right, to be to be a good leader. Um, and two is I, I kind of feel like as a leader, you have to be um, kind of like willing to uh, draw your line in the sand and willing to lose your job and um, you can't really just be a yes person for whoever's above you. Um, so sometimes you are disliked, um, but I think in order to be effective, you kind of have to take that stance, right? You have to, you have to be expendable. Um, so I, I like that there's, there's two points in that. Um, so what is leadership? I kind of like came up with four different things that I found, but Ability to translate a vision into reality, um, you know, uh, able to establish what is important and articulate why, to inspire others and cultivate a desire. And then I stole this last one from um, Amy Powell, who is in the back of the room um, and did this talk last year. So I stole some, some different parts from different, different people who are in the back of the room judging me. Um, but uh, I added listen to this at the beginning and then set a vision, create a path, choose a team, empower the team, measure the results. And sometimes you don't really get to choose your team, right? Like if you come into a faculty chair job and there's already a faculty, you don't really necessarily get to like fire all the faculty because it's like almost impossible to fire a state employee in Nevada. Um, they, they even had a faculty member who was in jail and they still couldn't fire him. Um, so, uh, it, you know, so you just kind of like got to work with your team, right? You got to empower the team, you got to build the team, that kind of thing. Um, so I like some of these leadership quotes. 
uh, leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. Um, people forget what you said, people forget what you did, but people should never forget how you made them feel. A leader takes people where they want to go. A great leader takes people where they don't necessarily want to go, but they should be, kind of like skating to where the puck is going to be. Uh, it matters uh, in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. I really like that. I think that's why you got to be dis, uh, ex expendable. And then to handle uh, yourself, uh, use your head. And to handle others, use your heart. And I think that's important. We'll talk about emotional intelligence a little bit uh, coming up. Um, so he wanted me to tell my, my story of leadership. Um, and so... I don't really think it's very impressive, but my, my background was I went to UNR where I am now and uh, I went there just because I could play baseball. Um, and then I went to UNR Med and then I went to a couples match to Wichita, Kansas from Nevada um, to uh, do residency at what was then St. Joseph's Hospital. And then when I was doing my fellowship at Ball State, uh, which is in Muncie, Indiana, and I thought it was a really good fellowship, but it's no longer uh, in existence. Um, and it was a 1.5 year fellowship, which I really liked because like you got two football seasons, you didn't have to start looking for a job right away. Um, I kind of I kind of liked that, but um, that model's also disappeared. But then during my fellowship, the two Catholic hospitals in Wichita merged together and formed what was called Via Christi. Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was other than sports medicine when I was a fellow, but as I went through fellowship, I kind of learned that I really liked academic medicine. And I really liked the fellowship committee and the education committee and my role that I had with the AMSSM and kind of doing, doing things uh, as, with the society. So I figured that I really wanted to be a sports medicine fellowship director. And at this time, I think when I was applying, there's only like 35 fellowships. There weren't very many. There wasn't an internet until I was a fellow. Um, and, uh, so I had the opportunity to go back to where I did my residency program and start a fellowship. Um, it took four years because when the two hospitals merged, they were like on transitional accreditation or temporary accreditation. So you couldn't apply for a fellowship until you're fully accredited. So it took us like four years to get fully accredited. So I was like the fellow for four years. Um, and then... Uh, we got accredited, and then I was the program director there for 12 years. I don't know if there's any Via Christi fellows here. I know they have three now, one. Um, and uh, so I did that. And then the last five years that I was the fellowship director, I was also the residency director. Um, I did both. And then um, when I left, I left there and had the opportunity uh, in 2015 to go back to UNR and uh, move home. So I couldn't pass that up. Um, let's see. So then uh, during that time, I was on the AMSSM Education Committee and the Fellowship Committee. And I kind of worked my way up to being the Vice Chair of Education, although it did, that title didn't exist in our, in, our, in our bylaws. There was no Vice Chair. But somehow, um, I was kind of functioning as, as a Vice Chair. Um, and then along the way, I got to be the Program Chair for the annual meeting in Tampa. Um, and then after that, uh, I was elected to the board of directors for four years. Um, on my second try, uh, it's not atypical to not make it your first time or your second time or your third time. But you can't, you can't just run for a position at AMSSM. You have to be nominated. Um, so someone above you on the, on the board, uh, on the executive committee, has to nominate you to run for the board you can't just decide you want to run for the board. Um, so on my second time, I got that. And when you get on the board, it just kind of depends what positions are open. So you become in charge of membership or practice and policy or whatever. And I just happened to luck out that I got to, to jump onto fellowship, which was kind of where my passion was. So during my time as the, as the fellowship chair, one of my fellows, the fellows have all the best ideas. It's, it's, it's not the directors. Um, but one of the fellows, one of my fellows said, we should have a fellowship fair just like the AFP does. So I thought, hey, that's a really good idea. So that was one of the things that we started when I was the fellowship chair. Um, and then another fellow 
um, he was the resident representative to the uh, Family Medicine Residency Directors um, National Committee. And so he's like, oh, we should have this with AMSSM. We should, we should start uh, having the fellows on all of the committees, like a liaison, liaison, so that you're right, that's a great idea. So we got that to go through too. And I know that one of you is uh, a liaison to all of the sports medicine AMSSM committees now. Um, and then in the year off uh, from the board, I was on this presidential task force to get ultrasound um, codified into the ACGME requirements. So uh, I basically spent that year doing that. And at the end, we got, we got that into the ACGME requirements. Um, and then I was elected secretary treasurer and the secretary treasurer along with the four presidents are what makes up the executive committee. Um, and then after that, um, uh, the next year I lost for president and then the next year I was nominated again and won. And so now I'm in the third of the four year cycle where you go second vice president, first vice president, president, past president. And so ways that I got involved in AMSSM so when I was in your position, I kind of felt like it was a good old boys club. I kind of felt like, you know, I didn't really know how to get involved. Um, I was on these committees, but no one really asked me to do anything. Um, you know, so I like wasn't quite sure what to do. And one of the fellows who was ahead of me um, in my program was uh, on the board. And I said, like, how do you get involved? And he said, I don't know, just do something and ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Um, so I did, and I wrote this fellowship manual, match manual, which kind of was this big time at the beginning of the internet. So they like stuck it on the website. Um, and that was kind of how I got my foot in the door. Um, and then I got to review some of the cases when, when they're always looking for case reviewers, when you guys submit cases for like presentation at the meeting, long time. And so, it has to be, everything has to be done as a group. And, and, and it takes kind of group mentality and group um, buy-in and a group effort over, the, over your four-year term to get things advanced. And so anything that happens is really not, I don't think at all related to one president. Um, it, it's, a group, it's a group effort and this is my group. Um, so things I wish I knew uh, and had started earlier. So to develop communication skills. So until I was a fellow, I don't think I had ever spoken in front of anybody. Like when I was in med school or residency, like I never volunteered for any of that stuff. I was like in the back of the room. Uh, I still am in the back of the room. Um, but in fellowship, I was forced to do two, two grand rounds. And I kind of figured out that I liked it and I, and I, and I was decent at it. And so, um, you know, and it was part of my process of coming into the realization I wanted to be a fellowship director and I could be a good speaker. And then I hated English. Like I never, I took one half of an English class in college. I hated it, horrible writer. But along the way you had to have, you have to get your fellowship accredited. You have to keep your residency accredited. You have to write papers, you know, for academic advancement. So you kind of figure it out along the way, right? You just, you kind of learn these skills, but I wish that I had started earlier. Um, uh, and work on team projects. So I'm kind of an introvert and I like to do things myself and I like to get them done. And I don't like to have to wait on other people who don't get their stuff done and I don't like to do their job. But I wish I had figured out earlier that, you know, doing team projects are important. Um, that's how you meet people. That's how you find your mentors. That's how you develop sponsors. Um, and that's how you build relationships. Um, so another thing that I wish that I would have started earlier, um, graceful self-promotion, right? It's hard to be, it's hard, it's hard to promote yourself. Um, you know, there are some people that are, really arrogant about it and are, you don't really want to be that person right but you also don't want to be the person that that never says anything and never gets involved because no one knows who you are because you're a wallflower so you you know you got to kind of promote yourself um uh, gracefully um and you have to find mentors and luckily mine were all within my fellowship lineage and you have to develop sponsors and that's not really something you do, but it's like something that happens when people see you do a good job, right? And um, 
And when they know they have to have a job done and they have a finite period of time and they have uh, a deadline and you're, and you're good at helping and getting things done, they're gonna get you involved. Um, and I wish I had developed some media skills. You know, I'm still not great at social media, but I'm much better at radio and television and things that I kind of learned along the way. And so the, if, if you ever get opportunities, even if it's outside your comfort zone, just jump on those things because in the long run, they're going to help you. And then goals versus opportunities. Like my goal was to be a fellowship director. I didn't really have any goals beyond that. Um, but along the way, I got to be a fellowship director and I got to be a residency director and now I'm the acting chair and I got to be the chair of the NCAA Medical Safeguards Committee and I got to go to the Pan Am Games and do the Paralympics and, um, you know, write all these papers with the AMSSM and be the AMSSM president. And those weren't my goals, but those were opportunities that just came along and doors opened and, and you walk through them. Um, so, you know, it's good to work through your goals, but it's also it's good to know when opportunities come along that you should take advantage of them. So other things that I wish I, I learned, uh, but I learned along the way is there are lots of people with annoying communicating styles, communication styles, right? You have people who are tanks and are pushy and like the bull in the china closet. And the orthopedic surgeon that I worked with in Wichita was like that. And we used to make fun of him because whenever he wanted to make a point, he put down his kickstand like this and leaned over the table. Um, and, you know, there's the know-it-all and then there's the people who think they know it all and they just like to hear themselves talk. And then there's the snipers who are not confrontational and they, and they just kind of do things behind the scenes to deal, derail you and cause problems. And um, you want to identify those folks. And then there's the whiners. And then there's the yes people who say yes to everything but get nothing done. And then there's the maybe people who never respond and then they don't have to respond because the deadline passes before and the decision is made before they ever respond. Um, and then there's the no people who say no to everything. And so you got to figure out who these people are and how to, and how to deal with them, right? So you have to set speaking orders in meetings so that the know-it-alls can't talk all the time. And um, you have to uh, have the app that asks the questions rather than the microphone in the middle of the room where someone goes and talks for 15 minutes. Um, you, uh, you know, set a time limit. You focus on the top topic. You create action items at the end of the meeting. And then you record the minutes and you write down who the, the snipers are and who the know-it-alls are and how and why people aren't really like helping progress the plan, right? You, you put that in the minutes and people don't like when they're put in the minutes for, for things that aren't productive. Um, and I think I stole this one from Amy, but does anybody know where the leadership class is? Like, that's how I feel. Like I've taken a few leadership classes, but I still don't know that I'm a good leader. Um, so we're always looking for that, for that, but I think in order to be a good leader, you have to have the, you know, emotional intelligence and self-awareness. And you guys have probably had more talks on that than we have as attendings, but, you know, I've done DISC training and Myers-Briggs training, and I've kind of figured out some self-awareness uh, of what my strengths and weaknesses are, what my biases are, you know, and, and I have learned to watch other people's body language when I'm talking and, and seeing if they understand or if I'm offending them or whatever. whatever. Um, you know, and then when you make mistakes, you don't like to make mistakes, but uh, when, when you think about the mistake, it kind of prepares you to not make it again, right? So that's self-awareness. Um, and then you want to harness your feelings, right? You want to think with, think, think with your head on yourself, but think with your heart on others. So you want to be humble and, you know, not get angry. Um, and you want to know what's going on socially and organizationally um, so that you, you know, you don't step in it when the organization is trying to go one way and you're trying to go the other way. Um, and then you want to manage your relationships and build your team, right? Um, I have a video about curiosity coming up, but, um, you know, you don't, like I said, you don't have to have all the good ideas and you shouldn't take credit for all the good ideas if they're not yours. Um, but if you recognize them and move them forward, like I did from, for our fellows, I like that that's really important, right? Um, and the, the one kind of bummer about, bummer or not bummer about being a leader is it's, it's no longer about you, right? It's about 
the organization or the team or your faculty members, or you're trying to, you know, build them up and get them where they need to go. It's no longer about you getting anywhere or you getting the opportunities. It's about other people getting the opportunities. And um, I think that that's important. And then along the way, you have to be mindful and reflect on, you know, your goals, your opportunities, your relationships, your interactions, and figure out if it's really, if what you're doing is really what you want to be doing, or if you need to be changing course. Um, and then, I don't know, is anybody a Ted Lasso fan? I'm a big Ted Lasso fan. So his, his like leadership lessons are, you know, to be a goldfish and I'm not sure why it's a goldfish. Maybe it's a tiny brain, but they forget when they do something wrong, they forget it right away, right? They don't dwell on it. And I don't think that that's really necessarily good advice for, for, for me in this position. But as a leader, I think you have to just realize you're not going to make everybody happy. You know, when you have a mask mandate, not everybody's going to be happy about that. When you have a meeting in a, in a state that people don't like, all the politics of that state, not everybody's gonna be happy about where that meeting is, you know, and you just have to, you know, do the best you can to make the right decisions and move forward. But you want to be authentic and you want to listen. Um, and you just sometimes have to agree to disagree. And you have to tell the truth and you got to believe kind of like his sign there, you know, be positive and humor always helps. And you got to like change to be a leader because if you're standing in place, you're probably getting passed. So you always got to be ready for change and how to move forward. And then, you know, he, he talks about no one's bigger than the team and he knows the janitor's name and he knows the, the field guy's name and, and everything else. And I think that's true. Your team is bigger than you and the team is the most important. Um, can you guys play that? So I think the point of that is you got you got to be curious as a leader, right? Like you can't just um, sit back and do nothing. You have to be curious. Uh, this won't advance. Okay. So qualities of a good leader. I won't I won't like read every one of these, but you know I think it's you got to be selfless and it's not about you. Um, you got to serve to give, not to get. Um, we kind of talked about, about most of these things. Certainly you have to be accountable and you have to listen. And then uh, when Stephen did this talk, he did a survey of the board of why they wanted to be on the board. And I took some of the responses here and some of them were to, to serve my peer group and, and, and my work family. And a lot of people think of AMSSM as their work family. Enjoy the collegiality be involved in decisions that shape the future of sports medicine, to pay it forward and to make a difference. So I think those are all, you know, great reasons to be in, in leadership for AMSSM. Uh, 
advice on becoming a leader from past board members who are all once in your shoes. So get involved with the committees, introduce yourself to the leaders, develop relationships, respond quickly to emails. You know, if, if you're the, the one who responds to the email on day five and two thirds of the people have voted in the first four days, it essentially makes your vote worthless um, uh, for, for most votes. So it's important always to, you know, re rep re reply quickly, be engaged, be available, be dependable, do good work, honor your commitments, meet deadlines, promote yourself, and then find your mentors and build your sponsors. Um, and I think that applies for MSSM, but that applies really for anything, right? Any, any job you want or um, any position that you want to be involved with. And I just read this the other day and I thought it was um, kind of apropos, but I'm guessing that most people know who Warren Buffett is. Um, Berkshire Hathaway, he's worth like $100 billion. Um, but it, it was basically his advice of four choices that separate doers from dreamers or kind of, I think, leaders. And he said, pick friends wisely. Um, and what he meant was pick, pick people who are going to help build you up and who are going to um, help you advance and don't pick people who are going to hold you back. Um, go, to, go to bed a little smarter each day. Um, and I always like the Jim Valvano saying that says, if you cry every day, learn every day and laugh every day, you've had a good day. Improve your communication skills we talked about. And then I've told you like over and over and over so far to take advantage of your opportunities, but eventually your plate gets too full and then you just got to learn to say no. And so you got to continue to reevaluate what you're doing. And when, when your plate's full, you got to start saying no. Um, and the pitfalls of leadership are certainly life balance, right? You, you keep saying yes and, 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 you're, and you, you have no balance. You don't have your, your family life and your personal time, et cetera. And then you got to remember that leadership is not management. Like it's really easy to be caught up in, ma in management. Like, you know, when things aren't going well in the clinic and you're the leader and the manager can't get the job done, it's really easy to try to like pick up the phone and, and do their job and, and, and make the clinic work better, right? But that's really not your job. You're, you're the leader. It's the manager's job to do the, the, the daily management. It's your job to, to like build the team and form the vision. Uh, and eventually you have to say no. And I don't really mean make your enemies your allies, but what I mean is keep the whiners, the snipers and the tanks and all the people who are like trying to derail you, like keep them close and give them roles that they can help you out with, you know, um, uh, make them allies and not, uh, not enemies. And then how do you get involved in leadership in AMSSM? These are your nine, and I'm sure probably most of you are here, but your nine uh, fellows who are liaisons to the committee, so you can reach out to them. You can also reach out to the committee leaders um, themselves. Congratulations to those of you who ran and, and got this. I know that a lot of people apply for these positions, and so it's quite an honor to get selected. Um, and these are some of the things that are going on in the committees, like the communication committees working on collaborate, the membership committees working on Im improving our, our structure and tracking opportunities for, for members and working on structural racism and health inequalities. And research is planning the CRN summit for underserved populations and health disparities in uh, sports and exercise medicine. The fellowship is working on a QBank. Education is working on MSK radiology modules. Ultrasound is working on pathology database. Practice and policy is working on sexual violence and sport toolkits. Um, international and interorganizational committee are working on traveling fellowships and exchange lectures. And then there's always publications that are coming out sponsored by AMSSM, like there's ones coming out on AD, ADHD and mono. So these are just some of the things that you could get involved with if you um, asked to. And then um, this is how I ended the talk at AMSSM too, but when you create a difference in someone's life, you not only impact their life, you impact everyone influenced by them throughout their entire lifetime. So go create waves. And if you're interested in AMSSM, uh, find your passion within AMSSM and create some ripples. So thank you.